The story begins in World War II with Harold Rhodes in the U.S. Air Force. I happened to be whiling away my unused hours in my Air Force training program by giving lessons to my buddies, lessons in improvising. Harold Rhodes was working for the, uh, uh, the then War Department with guys who had been injured badly. All we had was a great number of injured patients coming back from the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, they were trying to figure out ways of creating some type of musical therapy. These young men might be in there for six months, and they don't have anything to do. So uh, he decided to teach them. He had the idea, well, wouldn't it be nice to be able to teach these guys how to play piano? And unfortunately, you can't bring a full-size piano into an army hospital or an Air Force hospital or wherever it was. He wanted to have an instrument that he could, they could put on a bed and a guy could play around and, and learn something. So he invented this little mechanical device. As I would walk across the airfield, I would come across B-17s and other disabled planes. And I saw aluminum tubing hanging out of the wings. And I thought, well, maybe I can make a piano-like instrument out of this scrap material. So I took the tubing and cut it into xylophone lengths and rigged up a hammer, a crude little hammer of sorts, out of the wood I could find and made a keyboard. And then I set about to teach these fellows how to convert their telephone numbers into melodies and how to play simple chord accompaniments. And it took off like wildfire. As a result of that, I was put in charge of the music instruction phase of the rehabilitation program in all of the Air Force hospitals. And the Secretary of War finally gave me a little medal and he stated, you know how many people you have exposed to music? And I said, no, he, said, he told me it was about a quarter of a million people. Now, after that, the question was, what in the world do I do with this information? And now I've spent 30 more years developing the instrument you now call the Rhodes Piano. With this uh, little crude piano, he thought, well, maybe I can make um, an improved version. About 1948, 49, he came out with the pre-piano, a much more improved version. I don't know how many he made of these, but they, they were troublesome. Um, parts would break, um, but he had a piano. This is the start of the Rhodes piano. Harold was kind of like a garage shop operator who had some interesting ideas and had some interesting concepts that he wanted to manufacture, but he never really had a sophisticated manufacturing process, and that's why he teamed up with Leo and to the Fender Company. Now, Leo had an amp line, which is cabinets. They made amplifiers. They're in the music business. They've got dealer structure. He had a great eye for looking at a part and figuring out how it was gonna be made and how it was gonna be made affordably, accurately, and give the performance that they were looking for. And I think he was able to take that vision and sort of look inside the Rhodes piano. Fender actually financed the, uh, provided the facilities and some engineering know-how and so forth, and some capital that uh, they could develop this Rhodes piano into a marketable product. If you would like a technical description of it, it's a tuning fork, an unusual tuning fork. One of the legs is actually a piece of piano wire, and that's struck by a hammer, so you have a legitimate action striking, which is like a piano. It's like an acoustic instrument. One day I was at lunch with Harold, and he pulled out a fork and he says, you want to know how I invented the action? It was just playing with a fork, like probably every child in the country has done. And Harold says, I can make a piano out of that. And then there is a little electric pickup that records that sound, much like a guitar, electric guitar. This mechanism is for every note of the piano in varying lengths. And thus, the Rhodes piano could be described as a tuning fork player. Harold and Leo had trouble engineering a good-sounding, full-sized piano from the tuning fork idea, but they were able to get the bass register working well. 
So their first creation was the piano bass, an instrument that could substitute a bass player's register. The piano was intended to be a portable instrument and was cleverly built into its own travel case for ease of transport and to protect it. While Harold and Leo continued to engineer the modern Rhodes piano, an electric piano manufactured by the Wurlitzer Company was already making headway on famous recordings. The first electric piano was a, a Wurlitzer, but it had a lot, of, a lot of flaws in it. The first time I heard an electric piano was Ray Charles on What I Say. Ray Charles and I uh, met when I was 14, he was 17. We came up together in Seattle right from the ground up. Ray Charles recorded the, what I say, the bottom bass line, it was pretty impressive. But later on, he began to use the Rhodes, and I found out I began to track him, and he's, I think he completely dumped that other instrument, you know, uh, which I thought to be very interesting if you go back and listen to some of those recordings. You know. It's interesting how things evolve. Because when I first started playing the acoustic piano, Electric piano. In fact, our bass player, L.D. Young, early on, try the Wurlitzer. It's electric. I don't want to do an electric piano. I think when I was 17, I I got my uh, father to get me a Wurlitzer, uh, Wurlitzer piano and, and brought it up to school um, so I'd have something to play there. Another song responsible for popularizing the Wurlitzer was written by Joe Zawinul for Cannonball Adderley's band. He wrote Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. You know, which is a, an amazing hit uh, for jazz. Uh, I mean, a real, real hit. There weren't that many real hits in jazz during, during uh, that period of time. But uh, Mercy, Mercy, Mercy certainly was. And Watermelon Man, my tune was too. This early rendition of an electric piano laid the foundation for this type of instrument into the public. Well, when the Fender Rhodes came along, I mean, that was like the 747 of keyboards. Uh, very inspiring. In early 1965, a deal was put together between CBS and Leo Fender, selling Fender musical instruments for $13 million, an astronomical amount of money for 1965. Harold's invention now had the backing of a new manufacturing conglomerate. CBS engineer Horst Absman began working with Harold in 1965 and they were able to make design breakthroughs to successfully produce a 73 key model. He happens to be playing Eddie Higgins several years ago, one of the first 100 pianos, wherein he played one of the pianos that I handmade for him. This electric piano released to the public, many artists began experimenting with the new sound. There was a silver top road, 73 keys, uh, when I joined the Don Ellis Big Band, which I think was right, like 1968. I was a really young guy, and I came down to LA and joined this band, and uh, they had a piano, and they had this other thing, and I didn't know what it was. I was like, what is this? I thought it was a toy. When I first saw this, I thought, you know what the first thought I had was like, Sun Ra will love this. You know, it had this, this kind of, uh, Lord, you got LeMay, I don't know what that thing it was, like silver and sparkly and, and these, this little keyboard and I hit it and, you know, and went plunk. Quincy Jones um, was using it uh, a great deal when it, when it first came out. We started with it in movies and we were always looking for new colorful sounds, you know. And of course, Billy Preston had played this instrument on the Let It Be album with the Beatles on Get Back. He did that fabulous solo. One of the very first bands to popularize the sound of the roads was The Doors. I'm Rayman Zarek. I'm the keyboard player of The Doors. I've played these things for a long time. And without this instrument, there are no doors. This is the Fender Rhodes keyboard bass. What a thing. This is, this is the bass player of the Doors. There's a joke 
that in rock and roll circles that goes, who's the bass player of the Doors? There is no bass player of the Doors. There's the Fender Rhodes keyboard bass, and there's my left hand. There's little Johnny who gets very insulted. He says, you know, I am the bass player of the Doors. What do you mean there's no bass player for the Doors? The Doors put the piano bass really on the, on, on, uh, out there. I remember thinking it was the coolest thing that this band didn't have a bass player, yet I was hearing these very rich, full bass sounds. So we're auditioning for gigs around LA, not getting hardly anything, getting no work at all. Um, did something in the South Bay in Los Angeles, I forget what the name of the club was, hoping to get a Monday or Tuesday night. The headliners, whoever the hell they were, that was a slick band, boy, you could tell by their amps. And the guy had a Vox Continental, and sitting on top of the Vox Continental, Eureka, is the Fender Rhodes keyboard bass. But in black black and shiny. I never got one in black. Well, I did later on, but the, the, the first one I had was the brown one, the functional woodsman. I thought it's like a woodsman kind of thing, and if I were playing in the forest, this would be a great one to have. But I saw this instrument, and I thought, oh my God, it's a bass, you know? It's a bass. It is a bass. I can play the bass with my left hand, play all the keyboard parts with my right hand, chord changes and soloing, and that's gonna work out just absolutely hunky-dory. And sure enough, that was the secret to the doors. kicked in. I said, all right, let's try. Light my fire. One, two, one, two, three. Bah! De -de 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 Everyone went, whoa. It was like there was bottom. There was like cojones. There were balls to the door sound. And we all looked at each other and just smiled and said, we got it now. That's it. They were also playing one, one of the uh earliest Rhodes piano, 73 key. The first one that came to me was Riders of the Storm because I remember that sound being so, so different. You can remember the bell-like sound in uh, Riders on the Storm that was Rhodes. Okay, let me begin in, in 1968, which was a very important year in my life. Um, I told the Crusaders that I was not going to travel with the Crusaders. We were not going out on a road. I was putting an end to working the jazz circuit of the United States because the pianos that I had to in, encounter in every single jazz club across America were absolute dogs. You go in a club or whatever, and you gotta play whatever piece of crap is there. And that is, that it really uh, is a tremendous, a lot of pianists end up in loony bins because of that, I think. The life of the piano player is the worst life that any musician could possibly have. I get very angry when I hear musicians 
complaining on a stage when I know they have their trumpet, their saxophone, their drums, their guitar, and I just have to sit over there on that dog and don't say anything. It was an upright piano that had 12 notes that worked. So I thought all my music in the early days was uh, Chinese music, you know, oriental sound. I was just making sounds. I actually was on the road once playing state fairs with a drummer, he and I, and we played for acts, you know, the roller skating duo and the train seal. and. Uh, and I had to play these pianos all through Nebraska and Kansas and South Dakota, you know. And I know most of them were, were not taken in during the wintertime. <laughs> so uh, the, the roads was a terrific thing for those guys. You, you can, a couple of guys can shove it in the back of the station wagon and you, at least you know what you have to deal with when you get there. It wasn't so, so different from the piano that, you know, it was like, ah, you can't deal with it. And yet and still, it was different, so you couldn't, treated like the piano. This was the savior for these awful instruments that we knew weren't going to be in tune. But if you brought your own Fender, you knew exactly what to expect every night. So it became uh, like the guitar, a portable instrument. And you could pack up, you could do two, three gigs a night when you had that kind of flexibility. Because at that time, even though, you know, it's big and it was a lot to move, it was way easier than trying to move a piano. And also the fact that it's so eminently portable. Uh, of course, if you're a road crew member, you wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but as a performer, you certainly do. Mine got a lot of use. I, I mean, when I, when, I, when I got my first car, I had to make sure it, it was big enough at least to get the roads in there. There were those critics who thought that jazz should always be acoustic. With the changeover, some people's heart for change to take, you know. A lot of musicians were, Eddie Harris and others, were using electronic instruments. Uh, and the critics were kind of putting their nose, thumbing their nose at them. What is that on the stage? What, what, what are you doing? This is my piano. Oh, no, you're not playing that in my club. Oh, no, I got that spinet over there. I bought that for you. I said, that ain't no piano. I'm not playing that. So I realized all I had to do was announce whatever he's saying to me to the people that came to see my show. Uh, the club owner does not want me to play this. And the people say, are you kidding? You must be out of your mind. If you don't play that, we're leaving the show. So they got the message real quick, you know. But a couple of them, I walked off. They were glad for me to leave, but they regretted it later, you know. There would be one artist in particular, through his revolutionary use of electronic instruments, that would bring the Rhodes piano to prominence. Miles Davis. Coming from acoustics and electric, it opens you up. You know what I mean? It's another way of thinking. And I, I, I um, would like to think that Uncle Miles was the one that had us all think beyond the scope. Probably the guy who should get a lot more credit for putting the Rhodes piano on the map is Miles Davis. Miles Davis did Bitches Brew, and they're like, <clears throat> well, I guess it's okay. Playing in Miles' band was the gig. That was the top, top gig for, for anybody. If it was in his head and he wanted you to try it, you know, you, you better play it. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. I remember uh, that, you know, Miles called a recording session. And uh, I showed up in the studio, Tony Williams was there, setting up his drums, maybe tuning them. And, and I didn't see a piano. And so I figured maybe it was coming in later or who knows what. You know, and, and finally I saw that nothing was coming in. And so I, I said, Miles, what do you want me to play? He said, play that. And he pointed to the corner of the room, and there was this electric piano. And I recognized it as a Fender Rhodes because I'd seen pictures of it. You know? And um, I said, oh, really? Oh, OK. But, but I was thinking in my head, wait a minute. Miles wants me to record with this toy, you know? And, and uh, because. Even though 
I had never seen one. Uh, and I hadn't really heard one. I heard about it from other people. And they told me, no, that's not a real piano. That's, you know, that's just some toy. So I was just spouting what I'd heard, you know. And, but I said, okay, you know, the master wants me to play it. Okay, so they moved it in place. I turned it on. And then I played a chord. And I liked it. I absolutely hated it at first. I guess for the first three, four months, I played only the piano, the acoustic piano. And then the, the eventful night when Miles threw an electric piano in front of me. We were playing a club. I believe it was the Jazz Workshop in Boston. Uh, and uh, that quintet was, was uh, uh, Tony Williams was playing drums. Uh, Wayne Shorter and Miles and Dave Holland. Dave Holland had joined the band just shortly before I did. Um, and at, at, I, you know, it's like one of those things you can't forget. As, as I was walking toward the bandstand, I was behind Miles and we were reaching the bandstand and I, I was headed toward, I didn't even see the, the electric piano, and I was headed toward the acoustic piano, the regular piano, and Miles just turned around and he said, play that, play that. That was it. It didn't have a hard edge of a piano. You know? and, and so it was warm, a warm sound, I thought. The first thing I noticed about the instrument uh, was, was the fact that I could play louder. And uh, you know, at that time, at that time, uh, Tony was one of the Tony Williams was one of the first drummers that began to uh, play in a, in a in an acoustic small group really vigorously. I'll use the term vigorously. Uh, I mean, really play a lot, you know. And, and he could develop some power. And and with uh, with uh, with just the acoustic piano and the acoustic bass, there was n there was no match. But I could turn up the volume and be just as loud as Tony Williams. That's what I was thinking. So he wouldn't have to lighten up on, on the sticks when, when I would play a solo. So I was kind of intrigued by that idea. What we were playing was jazz rock because again, it had the mass and volume of rock and roll, but the sophistication of jazz, harmonically and rhythmically. So it was like jazz slash rock, you know, um, it was instrumental and um, it was just, it was turned up. Chick Corea had the top off this and he had it hooked up to a ring modulator and it just sounded like, it sounded like Hendrix playing a guitar practically. The road sounded like an animal. He played just this, this silver top one and it sounded like an animal. It, it's such a unique, the Rhodes has such a unique sound. Uh, and like he took that sound and just raised it up a notch. I remember going to the studio and there were three keyboard players. It was Chick and, and myself and Joe Zavano, or sometimes it might be Keith Jarrett in there. And I think in a silent way, that first record had Chick Corea and Herbie both playing Rhodes. And even Zavano was on that, but he played organ, if I re remember on that. So you have three of these heavy guys on one record. Two of them were playing Rhodes. So that changed my life forever, and that, that was because of, the, of uh, the Fender Rose piano. Herbie Hancock, who was relatively new when I came to New York, but he was setting quite a pace. Uh, his popularity grew very, very fast, and he brought the Fender into the picture, and probably brought along a, other, a lot of other players who were trying to be like him. The first Herbie record that really just, you know, made me go, wow, that's, that's what I want to do, was the uh, Fat Albert Rotunda album. It was a new instrument, so there was no trend yet. You know, I, I played it because I thought it was an interesting sound. He was playing the blues with the Fender Rhodes, and even though that record was made with a bunch of jazz musicians, he had Joe Henderson and Tootie Heath and, you know, all, the, all these sort of straight-ahead cats were all playing like kind of a Boogaloo-style jazz on the record. Something in me was not being satisfied, and I didn't know exactly what it was, but I, I, I got tired of, of just playing a music that required an individual's undivided attention. 
and I wanted to explore some other territory. And um, I had already been listening to people like Sly Stone and, and James Brown and, and some others. And, and, you know, which got back to my own personal roots from when I was a kid, when I listened to rhythm and blues and I also listened to classical music. The Headhunters album after that, I mean, that even, that took that little germ of an idea of like Funky Rhodes playing and it, and it propelled it, you know, it was even like a hundred times more powerful and funky and great with those musicians. With Headhunters, originally I wanted to create like a real kind of funk album. But it wound up being kind of funk jazz anyway. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going for, but what I learned over the years, and, and, and since then it's been proven to me many times, is that you can start with a certain idea, but at a, at a certain point, the music begins to tell you what it wants to be. Herbie Hancock's Headhunters album was at one point the largest selling jazz record of all time, receiving platinum status in 1986, and continuing to be sold and relevant to this day. I came up in the glory time of Fender Rhodes because uh, my first uh, memories of the Fender Rhodes was Herbie Hancock playing on that uh, Headhunters album, Chameleon, and that was an amazing Fender Rhodes sound. I had a clavinet, which for me, I thought I could use as a substitute for a guitar. Let me be the guitarist in a way on this keyboard. And, and, and I had the roads. So I had, I had a lot of different colors to, to work with, and that was, um, it wound up being a new sound. Herb is a monster, man. It's the absolute best. His writing has always been, his, his uh, compositions have always been incredibly uh, lyrical and singable. Herbie's that dun bun up bun up bon dun bon 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 da 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 You remember that? And then it had that break. You know, everybody was just like, that was just the funkiest record and it was groovy Rhodes. Needless to say, his contribution on Rhodes is staggering. But it's like Marty Boulanger used to say to me when I was studying with him, your music can never be any more or less than you are as a human being. It's true. Herbie's a great human being, the best. A follow-up to the Headhunters album, Thrust, continued in this style with notable tracks such as Actual Proof and Butterfly. It's one of the most memorable songs that, that um, I had a chance to, to write, actually, along with Benny Maupin. He, he and I both wrote that. Um, and that's... Uh, <laughs> fellow Miles alumnist Wayne Shorter formed a very influential fusion ensemble, Weather Report, where the Rhodes piano and other electronic elements were a mainstay of the sound. I was at Atlantic Records and uh, I saw a friend of mine, Joe Zavano, who was already getting to be very known at that time. I had already had it. He was telling me how much he liked what I did and how funky you are, you know. And he said, come over here, check this out. I think you might like this. And I said, what is this? This is a new piano called Fender Rhodes. So when I sat down, I think I hit one chord and I, oh my God, and I knew it right away. That's what I've been looking for. He was very open to um, um, electronic elements. Maybe my favorite is uh, the late Joe Zavinul from uh, Weather Report who played with Cannonball, and then he played with Miles, and then he started Weather Report, and uh, just absolutely uh, uh, magnificent. He kind of spoke to me like a big brother, and 
Uh, when I when I heard him playing with Donna Washington, I was like, who in the hell is this white dude? And when I found out he was he was Austrian, I was like, how in the hell did someone in Austria Austria learn how to play like 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 that? He eventually told me the GIs were there, and he he learned from the GIs what uh, jazz, what soul music was, what what that was all about. Uh, eventually. Uh, Joe began playing with Cannonball. I would see him at the, the lighthouse in the mid '60s, and I knew he he wrote "Mercy, Mercy" and all that. So hearing Joe's Zawinul, mean, he just had a chordal structure that was uh, just superb. So you know, he's obviously one of my favorites. And he took it, like, of course, much much further. In fact, if I had to say so, um, I think he's my biggest mentor. The group enjoyed great commercial success with Zawinul's song, Birdland, from the Heavy Weather album. Weather Report, now we can get into a whole other thing with the kind of sounds that Joe Zawinul got into using, um, you know, heavily, heavily chorused uh, road sounds with wah-wah pedals and, um, you know, it, it just gave it a whole other character that like no one had ever heard. So that was even, in, in a way, just from a sonic standpoint, the stuff that he was doing was even more creative. Joe Zawin on Weather Report used to edit a lot of their stuff, some of their records at my studio, because I had Studer, as you see my Studer back there, I had a Studer 2 track. And they used to just come over because I had a good studio for editing. And it would always be back there in the back editing, but no one would ever go in there because the door would crack open and we'd listen to him. As you know, he's, um had this wonderful ability to be able to divide his brain into two and play two separate keyboards which are totally disrelated in what he's doing. And uh, he said the secret to that was to learn to write with whatever hand you don't write with. In other words, if you're right-handed, learn to write with your left hand. Unbelievable. One of the great musicians and gifted spiritual people of all time. Joe, Sawano, my people. What are you creating? That's the important thing. And Joe Zavino created a body of work that's uh, profound as far as I'm concerned. with Dave Holland, we formed an acoustic group called Circle, which was, uh, which was uh, experimental music and free music we were playing. But then I, then I wanted to put a, a different, more melodic and rhythmic group together, and that's when I put Return to Forever together. And that's when I got my first roads, and I started to, to learn how to get a beautiful sound out of it. I was playing with a saxophone player named Joe Henderson, who's no longer with us. And our keyboard player couldn't make it. So Joe said, we're going to get this guy from New York named Chick Corea. Now, I had heard a one record that Chick was on. So Chick came to Philadelphia and we played and we sort of took over the stage and had this great rapport. And Stanley was playing his upright bass and he had this huge rig behind him. It was the first time I ever heard an acoustic bass played that loud and that, and that rhythmic and that great, you know. And I had my Fender Rhodes working with Joe. So Stanley and I hooked up. We, we became uh, mates right away and uh, started to form trios with Stanley. Uh, and and write, I continued writing music and until we had the, the quintet version. The first horn player in Return to Forever actually was Hewitt Laws, playing flute, playing, playing, uh, playing. Hubert played the, that melody. anybody else. I mean, you know, Joe had his style, Herbie had his style, but Chick was very, very rhythmic because he is a drummer.
I liked the the melodic sound of the Rhodes and how it how it how it blended with the way Stanley was playing acoustic bass. That was a sound that that I enjoyed. It was light, but it had an Im impact to it, you know, and it just seemed to work for my music. So that is really how Return to Forever started. first electric return to forever album which is called hint of the seventh galaxy the meat and potatoes on that record was chick playing the fender Rhodes. to get that sound it was like the stanley's bass and that the road sound it was like animals it was like <sighs> when that came out with bill connor's playing guitar and that record came out with the hymn of the seventh galaxy uh the power of that band was absolutely mind-boggling you know it was a quartet but the way Chick had wrote and arranged, and then hearing how he was playing that, I, I don't really think I could have heard that on a piano. You know, it, it wouldn't have worked. It would have never happened if it was just acoustic piano. I mean, you know, that's a wonderful instrument, but this instrument, I, I do believe that it did enable and empower keyboard players uh, to be able to reach, reach further out. And also that music introduced a lot of younger people to the jazz art form. In 1969, I did a, a, a gig here in LA with Jean Laponte, who's a violinist. And we played this rock club. The producer of Jean Luc's records thought that it'd be good if we played in a rock club. So I said, Jean Luc says, I'll do it if George does it. So I said, okay, I'll do it if you have a piano. Cause something told me it was a rock club, they wouldn't have a piano. So Dick Box said, don't worry, there'll be a piano there and it'll be cool. So I said, Jean Luc, okay, that's cool, let's do it. We did the gig, I got down there, there was no piano. They had this silver top rose. I said, that's the same piano I played with Don Ellis. I said, what a drag. But I got, but you know, looking out in the audience, there was Quincy Jones, there was Frank Zappa, there was a Cannibal Adderley, there was, uh, I mean, Gerald Wilson. There were all these like my peers, not my peers, but my heroes, my musical heroes. I was a really young guy. So I said, uh-oh, I got to play this rascal. That's all I got, you know? And I discovered that when I started playing it, that I said, oh, there's some knobs here, what does this do? And then, so I turned this knob and I said, oh, you can turn it up. I mean, I can play louder than the drummer. Yeah, I like that. So I started doing this and then I found, I said, oh, vibrato, wow. And I found if I did the, the volume knob like, hey, 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 I can make that do that. And so I started experimenting with it. And, and Frank Zappa was having to be there that night. So uh, I started playing with my legs, my, I did everything totally extroverted that I could think of on this piano. And eventually I guess somebody notices that he's crazy. Frank Zappa asked me to join the band. That's exactly what happened. And I think one of the artists who brought it to the front of really its uh, adaptability was uh, George Duke, because he, he kind of put the funk in the roads. Uh, it was a 
Sunday afternoon. I remember, you know, I was there for dinner with my mom and uh, she and, and the phone rang and she said there's somebody on the phone named Zupa. I said, Zupa? Who the hell is Zupa? So, oh, Zappa. He's had a lot of praise and a lot of accolades in his life, but he, still he's underrated to me. So he called and he says, George, I want you to join the mothers. So I said, uh, the who? Because he's one of these guys that does so many different really distinctive, different things well. So I went to LA the next week, and uh, that was it. That's how I joined the band. And he had a Fender Rhodes there when I went. Not a piano, it's true. He'd go over to his Rhodes and just break your heart with some of those things he'd be playing. You know, Rush, <laughs> he was just, whew. George. Return to Forever. I was in Pori, Finland when I first met Stanley Clark, by the way. And my roads got messed up. They, it came in, uh, you know, off the plane, and I don't know what had happened. It, it was the metal sticking through the thing. It just it was gone. It was a disaster. So I asked Chick if I could use his piano. I didn't know Chick at the time. And so the promoter went, I went to his Chick says, yeah, okay, use the piano, but, you know, be easy on it. And I was playing with Cannonball. Man... I beat the stew out of that piano. It was, I no stuck, you know? I mean, it was like, you know, you know when they just lay flat and stuff, <laughs> and it was out of tune, and it was the only roads in Finland uh, at this festival, Pori Jazz Festival. And so Chick was pissed off at me. So Chick, Chick, man, he had to play with Return of Forever with well, four or five keys, generally, you know, kind of sporadically placed cross keyboards, not working. He was living. He was living. I said, I'm sorry. I was apologizing. I said, Is there anything I can do? I got to hold it up for you while you're playing. And then, <laughs> yeah, I beat it up. That was a, that was a terrible story, but that's a true story. And that's that was my first introduction to Chick. <sighs> I hope he doesn't remember it, but it's true. Oh, I don't remember that. George's gonna be happy that you don't remember that. <laughs> I, even if I did, are you kidding? How, how could yeah, I? Yeah. yeah. George. Yeah. I love George. period when I first started playing it on all my gigs, a lady I know who was a pastor, she walked up to the stage and she said, you're great on that uh, grand piano, but you're a motherfucker on that Fender Rose. And so we all started laughing and went crazy. So that's something I never forgot. I hear a voice to this day saying that to me and it was the crowd standing around, me, yeah! Listening to Les McCann, you know, uh, you know, I just saw that stuff. <laughs> Woo! Everything about the sound of this instrument was highly spiritual and highly inspirational to me. You know, it just turned me on in a way that you'd think a, a, a drug would do. You know, it was perfect. And with these hands. I'll 
tender love as warm as me. This is what made me want to sing. This is what made me want, couldn't wait to get to work at night, you know, because I couldn't wait to hear this music come from this instrument, you know. I'll never let you go. piano sort of made my solo career happen. So whether it would have happened without that phenomenon, I don't know. I think the first time that it really caught my attention was on uh, the Quincy Jones walking in space. And then I, I don't remember if I knew, but later on I found it was Bob James. We, we did a lot of work together. I first met him, oh my God, when he graduated from Notre Dame. Then I got him a job with Sarah Vaughan. He was very young, you know, like 19, 20 years old. He got a job with Sarah, so I felt good about that. But Bob is, is musician supreme. Uh, and we still work together. I had just come from playing uh, a recording session with Roberta Flack, and they had asked me to play Fender Rhodes on that session. And uh, the producer was Gene McDaniels, and he had written this song called Feel Like Making Love for uh, Roberta. And uh, as soon as I heard it, actually as soon as any of us heard it in the studio, we all kind of knew that this was going to be a hit. Matter of fact, just about every song, when I was a kid learning about music uh, early on, every song had a Fender Rose. Bob James had a song uh, that he arranged for Grover Washington Jr called Mr. Magic, and it starts off with Defender Rose, and it was just everywhere. song that I had in my head that I was aiming for to be the main theme. Uh, and so I brought it in and, and recorded it and played it for them. And I think they liked it. But one of the other pieces that I had just done, thinking that it would be some background music for the show, uh, they said, well, we like this. Uh, and uh, I had called it Angela. sort of melancholy little piece and uh, they said well would you mind if we use that instead of the piece that you submitted I ended up using it because it became the title song of my album touchdown and that song touchdown was the piece that I had originally submitted to be the theme for taxi The Crusaders began to record, and the real uh, true musicianship of being born in Southeast Texas, of, of having Louisiana roots, of, of, of having second line roots, of having rhythm and, and blues, blues and gospel roots, began to surface. 
And for the first time in my life, I made a decision that I was not going to be ashamed of my real, true African-American roots. We were going to let them pour out. So that's when we started creating some of the very first jazz uh, soul music. Joe Sample is known to have his own particular brand, his own particular sound. He likes to play the uh, Hamburg Steinway, because he likes the action on it. But he was one of the first guys I heard also that you could tell it was Joe. You could tell it was Joe Sample, and he loved his Fender Rhodes. Most of us did. The Crusaders created the Crusaders because when everybody went over there, we found success by going over here. <laughs> we never. I listened to the radio for six months. I'd get bored to death because I'd been hearing the same thing for six months. And I'd say, man, what would make me smile now? Some shit just like this. And I started writing the next Crusaders record. It never failed. It'd go to number one immediately. Of course, there's the Crusaders records. Uh, uh, Joe Sample. I, I was so blown away with his technique and style of playing the Rhodes. A few years ago, I found out that Joe Sample had three or four Rhodes and a, three or four worlds were stuck in a in a, a warehouse somewhere, I, and brand new, still in the box. I said, man, open that up. I said, uh, Joe, take me down there right now, because I'm using it on my next record, because <laughs> mine was in the shop. One of his, my favorite tracks they ever did is that Street Life, Street Life. The solo, hey, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> because he went on, on, a, on a groove. It's a fantastic solo. utilized electric instruments in their sound. Larry Dunn speaks about joining the band with Philip Bailey. We actually opened the show for the older Earth, Wind & Fire when they had the two albums on Warner Brothers. And uh, Maurice and Verdine came down to the club to see me, me and Philip, you know, in the band. And eventually they disbanded. And eventually Philip came back to Denver and I was in a little bar group and I was playing uh, organ and we were opening the show for, for war. And so I did like a 10 minute B3 solo and Philip went right to the phone. Reese, I think we got the guy. The song dictates what it, what it needs. When you write a song, you uh, listen very carefully to the vibration of the song. And so the song will let you know where, where to take it. Because you need a, a full sound on certain things and other things are a very small sound. And so some songs need strings, some songs need horns in order to like create this wall of sound. Earth, Wind & Fire changed my life. They changed my life originally when I first heard them because they were so amazingly distinctive and the keyboard runs were incredible. Um, it was, of course, my first hit was September and uh, I co-wrote everything on the I Am album except for two songs and I was at almost every session for that. 
all generations, you know, just crosses all colors, all nationalities. Earth, Wind & Fire had their own songs. They had a song called Reasons, where the Fender Rhodes was like the main instrument. I know Larry Dunn, the keyboard player at the time, was just elated the fact that he did have the Fender Rhodes because he could then pump up the volume and be a, a part of the landscape because everybody else was. One of the biggest concerts we ever did was the first California Jam. That, that was deep, you know, it was, it was so big that they had to fly us in in helicopters and they had the stage was on train tracks because they had to keep the stage moving. And it's like, you thought you would think you would be nervous but you know, when you look out there and there's a quarter of a million people, it's so big that, you know, it's like, you, you must look like an ant to them. And then we were doing, you know, the old stuff, Time is on Your Side and stuff like that. That was a great concert. playing combined so many different influences and the, and the fact that they made these unbelievable pop records but they had you know hints of jazz and hints of african stuff and it was just so interesting it was just thrilling to be there and actually see him in action called Sun Goddess, and Ramsey was playing the mess out of her roads. So Maurice came to town. He said, but I, I want, you know, you know, I love the, the, the sound you used to get on the Fender Rhodes. So can we use the Fender Rhodes? I said, sure. I said, I'd still love that sound anyway. So the song he had, uh, I can't that was 30 years ago. It was called Hot Dog It. And it took us three days on that song, because he says, I'm d destined to make this the biggest hit you ever had. And we finished it, and it sounded good. I, I, I can't remember all of it. Uh, it sounded really good. And he, everybody was kind of packing up stuff. And he said, oh, we have this melody. It's just a melody. It's really simple. And we're never going to use it. But it's a nice melody. Uh, and it's oh, the solo part is is a solo two changes, and it's mainly a solo song, but it has a nice melody. Why don't we just put it down? And where it took three days to do the so-called hit, it took us about three hours <laughs> to do the one that he almost forgot to give me. Uh, as he left, he didn't have a name for the second song. And I said, what are you going to name it? He says, uh, 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 call it Sun Goddess. It's, <laughs> you got your hit. Don't worry about what the name is. Of course, Sun Goddess became a very big hit. And the electric piano, the electric piano, the Fender Rhodes piano, as far as Ramsey Lewis performing on it, became popular again. So I started start carrying it on the road again, <laughs> which was fun. But you know, actually, that, would, that tune we did with Ramsey, you know, Ramsey did first, and then we decided to do it live on Gratitude. And then, you know, it just became a thing. I did an album called Mother Nature's Son that um, had uh, all the Beatles songs from the White Album, Beatles White Album. And he played that for me, Charles Stepney did. And the Beatles were doing a good job, but I didn't hear them in a jazz way. And he said, can I just arrange a couple of them and show you what can happen? And he did. And um, it was one of my biggest albums. I would 
have to say that as we moved into the 70s and well into the 80s, that the Fender Rhodes became a definite part of my arsenal. It became a definite part of the sound that I was looking for, the sound that I would expect. Uh, especially when I would move from the Steinway to the Fender Rhodes. It would add to the color, if you will. I was working with uh, the Friends of Distinction, which I wrote the song uh, along with Anita Poré, uh, that one of the big hits, You Got Me Going in Circles. And uh, we were in the studio, they brought in this big instrument. I think I had seen the, the small one, they brought in the 88. Jerry Peters was involved in many landmark recordings where he employed the Rhodes piano. Earth, Wind & Fire, a lot on the Spirit album. This is a song called Burning Bush. He's just one of the really unsung heroes of the, of the music business. A lot of Motown stuff, uh, the uh, Marvin Gaye project, uh, I Want You. He's a great man, great writer, great player. I think somewhere between uh, Herbie and Zawinu, and I think on the uh, Bitches Brew project, I think when uh, Miles Davis, they were using the Echo Plex. So, so uh, that led me to use the Echo Plex on on a song that was uh, recorded for Denise Williams called Free. Maurice White, who was one of my production heroes, uh, leader of Earth, Wind & Fire, had produced uh, Denise Williams, who sang originally with Stevie Wonder, Wonder Love. And Denise had a, a record, her debut song was Free. And Jerry Peters, just this beautiful, ethereal introduction to the song with the roads. I decided the summer of 71, the summer before my senior year in high school, I was going to have one. I wanted one. Of course, I got to give it up for um, baby fingers for Patrice, you know. So Mr. Rhodes actually uh, uh, helped me pick the piano that I do still have. It was a suitcase model, uh, 73. People like Patrice or Chikria or Herbie became part of Harold's family in a way. Mr. Rhodes had heard about me and told me, well, let's see if we can find something really special for you. And the pianos are just rolling down the conveyor belt, you know, and he says, that one. And, you know, I don't know if he really knew that this was a really great one or if it, or if it was just 
you know, the gesture, you know, of making me feel like I'm going to pick your piano. But whatever, it turned out to be super. She had a great song uh, ballad, Settle for My Love. And uh, Music Soul Child covered it later, and other people have covered her music. But uh, uh, songs like Haven't You Heard and The Road's Use and that, uh, Patrice became one of my heroes on the Fender Roads. Patrice uh, had a very indelible effect on me with the roads because I always loved how her roads sounded. The sound of the roads all, already had, had got my ear because it had the ability to both blend and also be a solo instrument. It had a unique sound, but the sound was able, it was just magic, it was able to kind of homogenize with other instruments. of the kind of sound that I wanted to have. Then I liked the way it sounded to solo on it, and I liked the way it blend with other things. And so I know a lot of people have identified with me using it. And I think the more I used it, the more it became a part of the what people identified as a certain part of my signature. I was listening to the road sound of those early Jeff Lorber Refusion records, and that was definitely the sound of that band. I hooked up, you know, hiring Joe Farrell to play on a couple of songs on the, on the second album, and I told the sax player in my band, uh, you know, I'm going to get Joe Farrell to play on a couple of tunes, and he got kind of mad. He said, well, why don't you get Chick Corea to play your parts? And I thought, yeah, that's that's a fantastic idea. I should invite Chick to play on the record too. That would be that would be, you know, unbelievable. I had to, I think Joe came in, he played the song down one time, and I think he thought that was going to be it. And I had to say, like, Joe, let me, uh, let's do a couple more takes, man, come on. <laughs> it was like, uh, so I had to sort of convince him to, uh, to give it a couple more shots. But it's funny, because the song that he played on, it's a song of mine called Catherine, that um, actually became a, a pretty big radio hit. And he recorded, ended up, like, years later, well, not too many years later, like a year or two later, he ended up recording it recording it himself on one of his albums too. To me it's just great to have this music that um, that I made so many years ago, it has, uh, you know, sort of another, another shot at, at life where people can kind of hear it and, and it gets, you know, new generation gets exposed to it. So, um, I mean, when I first heard the Little Kim song, nobody had told me that it had been sampled. And I was actually driving in my car and I turned the, on the radio and I heard, <laughs> I heard that song and uh, it was like, Whoa, hold on. I, I had to pull over to the side of the road and like, whoa, what's this, you know? <laughs> anyway, there's uh, Rain Dance, which was, yeah, that was sampled by Lil' Kim.
Some people know me for playing. Some people know me for the records. Some people know me from concerts, but I'm basically an arranger. I have been an arranger back in Brazil. When I left Brazil to come here, I was an arranger. I remember when Diodato came out with a 2001 theme. That's just everybody's perked up his ears. I mean, that's like, that was like a, the, the solo. It, this was the solo instrument on that. They used to have a 73, I believe, a stage model. That was it. That's where the 2001 was done. Yeah, the 2001 theme. And yeah, that was like a big seller. And you know, he wanted to play electric. I was playing electric bass. There were two basses on that session, Ron Carter and myself. You know, it was the sound of the roads. It wasn't the music, because everybody had heard the theme, and those guys were just jamming. It was the way he played this, and he could do all these glisses, you know what I mean? Do all these kind of glisses, goes. instrument it would sound like noise and yet all you have is you have this, this funk groove going behind this whole thing on Diodato's record I remember that was a very everybody was talking about that record you know I think that record sold did more for Fender Road sales than uh, probably as much as the Beatles did for Ludwig drums I think after the record it was very popular everybody of course wanted me to go play and of course this was the baby to take but because these are very delicate instruments sometimes especially for traveling um, I had to buy a bunch of them, so because sometimes they would break, I would have them shipped back and shipped the new one in, etc., 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 and come back. So to a point where I know at one point, sometime in the mid to late 70s, I had at least 14 or 16 of these pianos with me. late 70s, I turned into production because there was a lot of demand. Um, the guys from Cone the Gang had heard a, a record that I did for Warner Brothers called uh, Love Island. But uh, we started uh, with the first record and it didn't do too bad. We had Ladies Night and then, of course, the usual comment, oh, it's, it's, it's an overnight thing, it's just uh, fly-by-night success. So next record I did, uh, Celebration, another fly-by-night. You know. enough to see a Fender catalog. I believe that uh, CBS and Fender had gotten together and it was a Fender catalog uh, and there was this keyboard was in it and I saw that and I said to my father I said man I sure would love to have one of these and I could join a band and be doing all this these, this playing and everything. So luckily enough my dad had been working with a great drummer named Louis Belson and Louis Belson had a Fender endorsement and I didn't know this because my dad let me, it was a surprise to me. He wrote two arrangements for Louis's band, and Louis got me a 73 Rhodes. Jeff Percaro was working with a guy named Boz Skaggs, who uh, was looking to write a song, uh, looking to write an album, excuse me. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be that chosen person here, of which ended up being the Soak to Grease album. I think it was about 1974. Let me look up. Yeah, we probably did it in 74, but the award I won here was for Lowdown that I wrote and we recorded on one of these instruments right here and I'll play a little bit of it for you right now. And you can hear that 
little Sly Stone, Larry Graham stuff, because Family Affair and Sly Stone was chugging at the time. And uh, it was music was at a great place during that era, you know, 74, 75, 76. And I won my first Grammy, and it was a large part due to, I would say, partly to this instrument here, which is the main instrument. David Page I uh, met because uh, our drummer, uh, Jeff Picaro, uh, was um, a, a friend of uh, Page, and, and they played in a lot of bands together. They both went to uh, Hollywood High School together. During that same period, um, when I made my first Toto album, uh, I worked, my father and I were producing a young, brand new talent named Cheryl Lynn, and we were able to uh, get in the studio with her, and uh, I came up with a groove that went something like this. album, I believe that I met David Page and uh, and he played on uh, Black Friday and a lot of other uh, tunes on that album. It's like if you say it, how many, how many records has a Telecaster or a Stratocaster or a Les Paul been on? How many records that people have heard have changed their lives? Love records. How many this kind of record? How much funk records? How much music has been played and heard from Offender Roads? A thumb piano on this instrument called Fender Rhodes. I was doing some studio work in New York, and I think there was a Rhodes, and I forget what it might have been the Hit Factory in uh, in New York. I love I love Fagan's music. I just uh, the songs just kill me, uh, and the vocal arrangements kill me when he has when he uses these hip singers you know behind him and, and the way he voices these these it almost has nothing to do with the pop sensibility you know that we're all used to and it's probably part of what makes him so unique you know we, we'd occasionally use acoustic piano um, which was always great of course but um, there was you know I think with uh, heavy backbeat music the rose was the, uh, often the right choice he didn't uh, overplay this thing either you know it was very it had its own role i used to play a, a lot of roots in my left hand and chords in my my right hand which was um unjazz like it was more like for playing uh more funky stuff and you know you'd, you'd say uh, you know, kind of primitive kind of a 60s you know type of boogalooey beats and stuff like that you know Kind of stuff, but as I I started depending more on the bass player to play the roots like in jazz, so I started ex you know playing a more more jazz style course. I think as I got older, I used it a lot on uh, you know certain projects like uh, the Donald Fagan's Nightfly album, um, and. Uh, you know, and, and I'm on most of that album, but one of the songs, IGY, that was the first song I remember uh, working on, and and uh, it involved the roads. And uh, they started building the track with me. So it was just me and a little drum machine. And the, the song, I, I just fell in love with the song instantly, and it was so hauntingly beautiful that I actually remember um, messing up on purpose just so I could start again from the top. <laughs> You know, when you're playing uh, the straight roads, you'll... There's nothing wrong with that. 
but it's 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 not gonna change. It's it's gonna you're gonna hit it, attack it, and then it's gonna release slowly with nothing happening. With with this, you've got you know. Uh, That's why I, why I like it. Yeah. Continue to write. I think uh, the the jazz stuff that we uh, were fans of started creeping creeping back in. So the chords got more complicated, and uh, it was more uh, adaptable for jazz chords because it was more acoustically uh, accurate, so that the notes blended better. So if you have a lot of dissonance in jazz chords, it was a you know a nicer sound. One of the Rhodes players whose signature is most commonly associated with effects, namely the small stone phase shifter, is Richard T. Oh, well, Richard, you know, was a was an unbelievable pianist. Technically, not that he ever showed showed that off so much, and he was one of, probably the best gospel piano player I ever heard. You know, if he was. If he was sitting there, the thing just worked, uh, and there was no, not much to question. And he made it possible. I got to play with him uh, on, on so the same dates with Richard playing either, either Rhodes or organ, and I playing the, the piano. Uh, and he was, uh, he was also working with Aretha in those days. Richard T and all those guys who really could handle from the Rhodes. He really made it his own. He had this thing, he had this sound that, and he carried his small stone with him. I mean, he would use the roads that belonged to a &M Studios, but he would carry the small stone, and, and it, it just had that kind of sexy, groove, chorusy, phasery kind of thing that none of the other effects had. He used to call it Angel, and then he would, uh, finish that statement off with the uh, anatomy of a woman because <laughs> it had that real amazing juicy sound <laughs> so uh, it's a family show so we'll keep it clean <laughs> Richard T was a, he and Chuck Rainey Eric Gale unbelievable Steve Gadd stuff Richard for me probably still the, the, the my big hero in terms of Fender Rhodes. I grew up with a Fender Rhodes in my house. So it was always a part of, we had a piano and we had a Fender Rhodes. So all my life, that sound, um, depending on which records I hear it on, will remind me of my basement or remind me of apartments or the lakefront in Chicago, growing up in Chicago. But the sound of the Fender Rhodes is part of the soundtrack of my life. Just the sound of the actual unit itself is a part of what I grew up listening to in the 70s in my home. Of course, Mr. Donnie Hathaway, uh, you know, of his extensions of a man. And then later he played on the song, uh, Till You Come Back To Me. And to me, that's one of the finest Rhodes tracks. I remember listening to Donny Hathaway and that sound just was like butter, you know, on his Extensions of a Man album, which is one of the great albums of all time. My memory of that record was that uh, I, I showed up at the record date late with a bunch of other guys. We were like the, the young the lions kind of very, we, we had our egos going and we just showed up, you know, like maybe five or ten minutes late. And he got really pissed off, Donnie. So we walk in there, 
And also, he f must have thought that we thought he was a lesser musician because he was an R&B musician and we were jazz musicians. So immediately he sat down and started playing giant steps on the keyboards. I will never forget that. He played it and then he went into another key and played giant steps. And I just stood there and I just said, okay, okay. You know, but he, he, was, a, he was a genius, that guy, Donnie Hathaway. Great musician, amazing singer, had a big heart. He really knew how to put his heart into his music there. I think that there's such an association with singers and the roads, like my dad, like Stevie, like Roberta, um, being able to sit down at a roads and do that. You can't get around Donnie Hathaway, you just can't get around him, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, oh no, someday we'll all be free, you know? And uh, of course he used it on Sack Full of Dreams. He was really, um, he was really a player. I really think that um, in his mind at some point, he was studying um, Youssef Latif and he was studying Gershwin and he was studying a lot of things. And I think the, that his mind was really expansive in terms of music. So we, if you think about a lot of the records that, um, that are still influential now, that people listen to the roads, and I hear guys all the time playing like my dad and singing like him. And a lot of those records were made like in his mid twenties you know, not even late 20s. So to um, have had that kind of impact that early, you can only imagine, you know. I got my first roads in 72. A lot of records that came out, uh, everything, everybody had these, you know. That was like the one thing when I was a kid I wanted. And, you know, I was like, I would tell my dad, you know, please, I want a Rhodes, you know. I, I gotta have that piano. And it was just, you know, it was like a dream come true. And I was like, I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna really learn to play it. I had no idea, you know, like when I first started playing and where it would take me. I would open up for various shows, you know, I got a chance to open up for Miles. I played with the Isley Brothers for a while, Frankie Beverly. Played with Stevie uh, for several years. As, as artists, you know, we're, we're a combination of all the, you know, experiences and different musical styles that we play coming up. Uh, I think it's one of the beauties of, of artists is that their personal contributions is, is distinct. Everybody has a distinct thing based on how they came up. That was just mine. who switched to Fender Rhodes. He didn't like it at first. Well, on his first gig, he got the biggest applause he ever had in his life. So from that day on, he was a Fender Rhodes player. His Ronnie Foster was his name. When I was 14, Jimmy uh, Smith introduced me to George Benson. Um, and it was funny because George was a big fan of Jimmy Smith. So he was coming in from New York and he was starting the next week at this club. So he came in a night early to catch Jimmy's last set. And so, you know, Jimmy goes, hey, George, you know who young organ player running right here to meet him, you know? So then George and I started hanging out and then I started working with George when I was 15 on weekends, still in school. So <laughs> that's how that whole thing started. Ronnie's crazy. <laughs> <laughs>
But I like Ronnie. Ronnie had a real distinctive, like really soulful way of playing the Fender Rhodes, you know. Um, I remember seeing him with uh, Benson, George Benson. The Breezin' album, uh, which was approaching 10 million copies now, he used the Fender Rhodes. You know, I had the pleasure of working with uh, an in incredible uh, pianist, uh, Jorge Dalto, who was missed a lot. Jorge Dalto was Latino. So he brought that Latino romanticism to everything he played. In fact, there were times when we were both playing Rhodes. That was a, was a great, great, great marriage. <laughs> I started working with Quincy's big band. I had known him, I met him in the 50, late 50s in Europe. And we did a couple of dates and stuff in New York, and then he decided to come out and do film scores. And, and uh, it was about the same time that I, I moved to the West Coast. And I was his, I turned out to be the, the piano player in a lot of his scores from that era. Was Andy Williams a company in Paris when I was over there in '59, and Andy came over to do a record with him, and so Bruce Bru Bru was his accompanist. Dave Grusin is just so awesome. Again, his playing and accompaniment, just as a film composer, but also his accompanying singers and everything. Again, David Grusin, when he does um, plays with Lee Rittenauer, all these people has his own touch that's so light. play one he didn't own one at the time but he played one for a film and then I worked on a lot of films with Dave um, three days of the condor and stuff like that where where this sound was that was essential you know that was the first thing in the film big part of the sound for me. The Rose was using so many records on so many soundtracks, so many movies, Flight, you know, Three Days of Condor is one of my favorite movies and records of all time. I'm telling you, we were rolling with, between records and movies, we were rolling all the time, man. And, and it was just, it was just coming and going. Quincy was going in to make what people later became Thriller album, which, uh, is was such a milestone album in all of our careers. God bless Michael. You know, thank you for uh, having us all play on that. And we miss you madly, you know. And uh, uh, there was a lot of Fender Rhodes on that. Again, they would have that set up in the studios for the most part. And whether it was Greg, Phil and Gaines, myself, or David Foster, or Quincy or whoever was playing right there, we would, you know, end up, there would be some combination with this instrument, as you could hear on his records. I've always been blessed to have the best musicians probably on the planet. Quincy would have, it'd be like having, it was like football. You'd have five keyboard players sitting out there between me and Foster and Phil and Gaines, and we'd all come in. It's like one guy, one guy, take a break. The other guy comes in and plays some parts. So it's, it's hard to tell who's playing what, except I do know Phil Gates is playing all those, all those bass parts. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was an amazing journey, man. Amazing journey. You know, any, anything that Quincy's done, the Off the Wall album, the Thriller album, any good roads down, that, that's, that's where you hear Greg Phil and Gaines playing. I didn't get one until later on. And you know who gave me a Rhodes? Actually, my first Rhodes, my first and only Rhodes, Michael Jackson. 
Michael Jackson stuff, the first album, uh, his solo record, Off the Wall, with songs like I Can't Help It, uh, played by Greg Fillingaines, written by Stevie Wonder, and so many other uh, tunes on that album just were just great use of the Fender Rhodes. I remember talking to him and, and somehow the subject came up that I didn't have a Rhodes. So one day this truck pulls up to my house and this you know guy comes to my door and says, you Greg Fillingaines? I go, yeah. He says, well, we have something for you. So I unload the truck, this massive box comes out and it's a Fender Rhodes and, and in it is a note and it says, well, I, I know you didn't have one, so I hope you enjoy this or something like that. And it was really sweet, and he forgot to sign it. But he's, you know, it's got this note, and uh, this beautiful road showed up. And I thought, well, that's really, really, really sweet. Greg first started playing with Stevie Wonder, and that's how he learned how to play when it came down. His first instrument he played with, with Stevie was the Rhodes. I was riding in, in the car with Steve. I was in the back seat, and he's in the front, and he turns around and goes, so how does it feel to be a member of Wonder Love? And all these things are going through my mind, you know, because I heard that he was such a practical joker and I'm trying to be cool, but then I'm thinking he's he may be messing with me. So I said, well, are you serious? He goes, of course I'm serious. I go, well, would you mind telling my mom that? So I figured he wouldn't lie to mom, you know? So uh, we get back to the studio and I pick up the phone, call the house, and hand him the phone. So the first voice she hears, the first voice my mom hears is Stevie's, and he's saying, "Hi, Mrs. Filling Games, and uh, this is Stevie, and uh, I want you to know that I, you know, I, I like the way your son plays, and I want to have him in my band, and I'll take care of him, and all this kind of stuff, you know." And then he hands the phone back to me, and so this is what you hear for the, like the next ten minutes. <laughs> you know, we're screaming, and he's just... the one that I'm on is uh, on Sons in the Key of Life. Everybody, man, Miles, Stevie, I mean, it's like the piano. Like talking about the piano players, there's hundreds of them, you know. Everybody uh, loved what that song was about because nothing else could could really accomplish what uh, that warm, mellow sound that the, the Fender Rhodes created. It's amazing. It's addictive, too. Very addictive. Greatest days of the recording industry, I, I believe, ever. It was so much of the music that you had never previously heard before. You couldn't wait to hear Stevie Wonder's next album. You couldn't wait to hear uh, uh, Steely Dan's next album. It just went on and on, and you had your favorite artist. That every time you heard something, it, it was something different how many gold records and how many hits and jazz records this little puppy's been on right here, you know? In fact, I'm gonna give it a little kiss right now. Just like that, for good luck. Becoming president of CBS Musical Instrument Division in January of 1981 was like being made captain of the Titanic just after it hit the iceberg. It's a difficult time. Synthesizers kept getting better and better. But the thing that was the real, uh, the final blow was the Yamaha DX7. That was the one product that we can kind of say, yep. The company wasn't as profitable as CBS wanted it to be. And CBS was kind of losing interest and starting to think, well, you know, maybe we should get out of this business. I saw this big, huge, wonderful factory slowly dying. And uh, 
They sold off uh, the whole Fender package. And it was left vacant, parts everywhere. And you gotta remember, this company, I mean, it was Fender, Rogers and Rhodes, had 1,300 employees, a factory 350,000 square feet, not including the old buildings as well. It was like a college. Fender went back to their basics, which was guitars and amplifiers, and the piano was just allowed to die. As the synth age ran its course, a new generation of musicians discovered music of the past, which many grew up listening to. The rich quality of the Rhodes sound that was used throughout the 70s influenced a number of up-and-coming artists to create music in a similar style. The result was a movement, a return to the Fender Rhodes. The resurgence definitely comes back for me, in my opinion, D'Angelo. I was his musical director right around the time Brown Sugar came out and I helped him craft a show to put together and um, uh, we did a, a big show at this place in New York called the Supper Club, I think it was, and we had standing room only crowd. I think Prince tried to come and he couldn't even get in and it was just, you know, it was just really crazy. Wallflowers had a show, some uh, private show for Giorgio Armani and some people, and some VIPs, and it was the Fuji's, D'Angelo, and the Wallflowers, and I'd never even heard of D'Angelo. And I remember, you know, talking to somebody during a set, and it started. I couldn't, I mean, the guy, it made it sound so cool. Obviously, he heard records when he was coming up that, that, that this was prominent, and he wanted to infuse that into the music that he was doing, and then all of a sudden, it was just like a new generation of, of, of musicians who had never heard this saw it in a different light. I guess when I was a teenager, I would always be lucky to find one like at a church if there was one. You know, it was just called an electric piano or whatever, but I was in desperate search for one right when I got signed, like right after I got signed, because just the whole aesthetic of where the sound was going, you know, Superfly and Curtis Mayfield and that stuff. And like, I don't know, the Rose was just like integral. It was just an integral part of that sound. We were stumped for ideas, and we just, it was just the type of thing, like we just started talking, and then, and then, and then like stuff started coming, you know, and it was just like, stuff started coming in, in and out, and it was just like, whoa. And he was like, I need this for my album. The first major record that I worked on, you, that used the Fender Rose with, um, with Erica Badu, other Side of the Game, which I wrote with her on the roads and we recorded um, with the roads. They definitely ushered in that era of, this, of the soulful stuff, with, which D'Angelo, you know, definitely pioneered and records with Erica. And of course, The Roots and Common and all those guys, you know, that whole, the whole sound, the whole soul sound. In the late 90s, uh, when the Counting Crows and the Wallflowers hit the scene and uh, in, in kind of an Americana rock and roll, but pop. Uh, a lot of those bands brought it back. I tend to not like when, when young artists or artists in general see something as beautiful and elegant as the Fender Rose and call it nostalgic or, you know, that's old school. Well, okay, but what's, if, if you're a new young creative artist, make it new again then. Show me what you can do with it, you know. A car in, in its concept is old school, but you still use it to get where you need to go. So this is the same thing. I guess my story is a little different than, than most of the other Rhodes players because 
Being a, a younger guy in my generation, I actually didn't grow up with the Rhodes. So I actually grew up with a, with a keyboard like this. The first piano that I ever played was a keyboard. I actually never played an acoustic piano. We didn't even, uh, we didn't even have one in our house. So I grew up playing, you know, seven years old or so playing a, a keyboard. And uh, I know there were all these buttons that were like, you know, a piano, electric piano, organ, and that kind of stuff. And it didn't even, being a young guy, it didn't even com you know, compute that those related to real instruments somewhere. I mean, my piano teacher had an acoustic piano, so you know I knew the acoustic piano patch referred to that, but I guess it didn't quite click that an electric piano button meant an electric piano, you know? So it, it didn't happen until high school when uh, my jazz director brought out uh, this piano-looking thing, and it was called a Fender Rhodes, and we were playing uh, Woody Herman's arrangement of La Fiesta, Chick Corea's La Fiesta. And um, so he brought out this Fender Rhodes piano and I sat down to it and I, I played a chord, you know. And I was like, oh, that's what that electric piano sound sounds like. And the sound was so much better on this electric piano, this Fender Rhodes. I was like, that doesn't even sound anywhere close to that, you know? And that's where the breakthrough was, when it was like, oh, okay, so, so this, is, this is just a jump off point and these real instruments exist out there. So then I went to the Hammond organ and then I went to the clavinet and I'm like, wow, finding all these real instruments. So I guess, I guess my journey is a little different because it was almost like a discovery of, you know, instruments of the past. Fender Rose and the piano to me. I mean, in terms of playing electronic instruments, there's no substitute for the real deal. It's just like, hey man, you know, to be per perfectly blank, it's just like sex. There's no, there's no substitute for the real thing. Did I say something there? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Nothing barks like that rose. It's like having your dog in the yard. Yeah, it's like funky. It's gone from being a product to being an icon. And so I feel that, uh, I, in a very strange way, it's, it's, it's dominated my life. And I've had the uh, luxury and the good fortune of being associated with an icon, which is not very many people get to do. Harold Rhodes, uh, with, his, um, with his intention to make an educational instrument that could be duplicated easily, came up with a, with a machine that, that uh, uh, I don't think to this day has has been um, more fulfilling to to pianists who like to play uh, electric instruments. He found something, and and it's still around all these years later, and I don't think it's going anywhere. I think that this instrument would be a major instrument, just like an acoustic piano. This is one of the major the major steps in musical evolution. I don't think Harold quite. God, how amazing it was that he'd, he'd come up with that. He was, again, I think he was so busy worried about the next this or the next that or that to just kind of stop and look to see, wow, look what I've created. You know, to create a unique musical instrument that literally has its own voice, its own place in history is incredible. I got to meet Harold when I don't remember, but I think it was in Fullerton. We chewed the fat for you know, a couple hours, and he was, he was very respectful and very genteel, and a, like so proud of, of what he'd done, you know, and how he'd put this thing together, and uh, get choked up thinking about it. Um, but he was, he was a great guy, and I, I don't remember the exact conversation that we had, but I remember the feeling of it being like, really, I'm in the presence of a, a master guy, you know. And he was, yeah, and it is. <laughs> Thank God for Harold Rhodes, the king. Harold's piano is one of the most fundamental sounds in creating music today. From a wartime rehabilitation tool to an iconic musical instrument, the Rhodes sound is now heard throughout music. Its legacy is carried in the hearts, minds, and ears of today's musicians and continues on its path of timelessness. There's one fact that I know. 
Nothing sounds like a Rhodes. You happy now? Yeah. Okay, wait, Gerald, why don't you come in and sing it? You know you want to do... I don't, I don't want to sing it. Have you met the ham over here? Come here, come here. No, 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 you're in here now. Come on. No, no, you're not. Come here. No, come here. I can't sing like Michael Jackson. Well, you don't look like him either. Come here. I know. No, no, man. I mean, no. How's that, guys? Ah! It's interesting to the ear, you know, the... The straight roads. Uh, Sorry, it's been doing that again. I've been. That's it. <laughs> That's what I do. Me, I'm sexy. You know, I don't look like nobody else. But when I'm playing this instrument, I feel sexy. I'm just moving around. You know what I mean? Hmm. Might write a new tune while I'm standing here. Yeah. Just so you can. 